Um, so today's talk is called Risk-Aware Multi-Objective Planning for Mobile Robotics. Um, I apologize up front. I took this talk almost entirely from a talk I gave earlier. So there can be a couple of slides that are obvious for this audience, but I hope you, you forgive me for that. And this is work that was mostly done under two grants that just ended, one with Nest and, and one with, with uh, ARL that, that Ron was also part of it. And it's mostly the work of my uh, recent student, uh, Shams Vizabadi, who finished um, this summer. And he's now with Intuitive Surgical. And part of the what brought him there is the fact that when you do certain kind of applications like surgical robotics, uh, these risk aware that I will define in a second uh, becomes uh, very, very relevant. Um, so this is one of the slides that I think is, is you know, for a general audience, but here will not surprise uh, anyone. Uh, but the one thing that uh, I think is, is segue into the rest of the talk is the fact that as now robotics enter every um, aspect of our everyday lives, uh, there was an email this morning from, from this Silicon Valley uh, venture uh, list that whose title was, who is not building robots today? Because it seems everyone is building robots. But as robots become an integral part of our lives, we start to have more and more expectations about these devices. So while in the past, a few years back, uh, we could be happy if the robot was working fine, now we expect the robot to do many things at once. So it becomes important to somehow design these systems so they can uh, achieve multiple uh, objectives and, uh, at, at the same time. So as, as Ron said, I moved to Yosemite 10 years ago, and more or less I've done uh, two kind of things. Uh, a lot of research on uh, multi-robot systems for distributed data collection, distributed mobility, environmental monitoring, the, the um, um, rapid project that we have with, with Berkeley uh, here is, is, in this, is in this domain. And the rest I've done more recently about grasping and manipulation. One reason was uh, that at a certain point I got tired of having robots just going around and looking and collecting data. So at a certain point I said, well, robots should start doing something. And, and so we got into uh, grasping. And I'm very happy to say that I'm not, I'm not going to talk about grasping today, but these movies that you see here are from my student, Shu Liu, who graduated last week. And he's starting with Amazon Robotics up in Seattle to, to do grasping for their uh, automatic warehouse. So in essence, uh, I think very much to the spirit of the CPART initiative, I see robotics as devices for physical intelligent augmentation. In the sense that there are a lot of things that we as humans are not very good at or we don't want to do. Uh, and this is exactly where, where these robotic systems can come in and, and complement and supplement or augment um, humans' performance. So this is, you know, a 30,000 feet view of the things that we are doing or we have done at uh, UC Merced through the years. Uh, this is RAPID, uh, the uh, multi-robot system that we're building to uh, adjust uh, irrigation in um, uh, vineyards. And hopefully in a year or so, we'll be able to give a talk with more details. We have how much? Three or four ECRA submissions right now. Um, a lot of work has been in, in uh, searching, in particular with drones. This is a video that dates back to 2011. Uh, and it was pretty different doing drones in 2011, in particular because that drone was $100,000. And this would be ridiculous today uh, that you can buy them for, for nothing. Uh, selectively, uh, I've done a lot of work in, in surveillance. Basically, how do we send around robots which, with the objective of collecting information in a, in a guaranteed sense? So you want to make sure that there is something in this building. You describe it, and you want to make sure that if there is something of that class, the robot finds it, uh, and other things. So a lot of this was under the general theme of sending robots around uh, to do data collection. And then, as I said, later on, we got into uh, more uh, interest in, in grasping uh, because this was mostly motivated by the RoboCup competition. We were doing robots who would go around, find people in the environment, but then very often you would like to do things like you know, pushing a door open or, or doing stuff like that. So this is how we, we got into this, this domain. And unfortunately, I'll, I won't have time to talk about that. But if you go to our website, you will find a lot of information about it. Uh, and then the last thing I, I want to say as, as a general introduction is that through the years I've been very uh, happy and lucky to have a bunch of beautiful students and wonderful students working uh, at UC Merced. So we participated a lot in, in RoboCup. And so we got second place in 2006, second place in 2008. Finally, in 2009, we won. So we said, OK, fine. Now it's time to retire. Uh, and we did. Uh, so we have been out for a while. And then last year, a bunch of students came to me and I said, hey, NASA has a new competition where we can deploy swarm of robots to do collection of items in, in a hypothetical Mars scenario. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. But then 
you know, if someone is insisting and is very motivated, you cannot say no, so on. Last year they participated, no, no price, but the deal is that next year they have to come back with the price, because you know, first year you learn, second year you win, right? That, that's the way it is supposed to, do, to be. So all of the research we do in, in our lab is really on the software side. Um, I'm a computer scientist by training, so I don't build robots uh, if I can't avoid to do that because this is not what I'm good at. And I like always putting this, this uh, provocative uh, quote by Scott Assam where he says, oh, hardware is easy, it's software that is difficult. And, and of course, people that do hardware will, will disagree, uh, but it's very self-fulfilling for me because I do software, so I can say, you know, I'm, I'm doing the important part. But it's more or less, um, Everything we do is, is really unknown. You know, assuming that the hardware is in charge of someone else, and there are you know, great people in this room that do hardware, how can we put uh, smart algorithms in, in, on top of those? So as I said, uh, the, the, talking, uh, the topic of this talk is about multi-objective decision making. Uh, so as, as, as we depend more and more on, on robots for doing things, uh, many tasks are multidimensional. What I mean with multidimensional is that as a robot moves around, multiple things will happen at once. Uh, it's going to consume energy, it's going to spend time. Uh, depending on what it does, it may uh, get itself into dangerous, uh, more dangerous situations. And think about a robot uh, operating in a, an environment where there are a lot of people. You don't want to get too close, particularly if you're moving fast. Uh, depending on the path it takes, it may travel longer or shorter paths. And so, in essence, when you're designing a, a control system, or a, like, a, like calling it an algorithm, coming from the computer science perspective, you should consider all of this, all of these things at once. Okay, you can, if, you, if you're just going to focus on energy, that's going to be great, but most likely you're going to miss badly on the other ones. And 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 when you have complex tasks being executed, um, just focusing one of these would probably not give you any useful um, solution. So this is a video that dates back to my very first PhD student that graduated at uh, UC Merced, Andreas Colling. He's now uh, with iRobot down in Pasadena. And his objective was to design uh, a system with multiple robots that would detect all possible uh, intruders inside the science and engineering building. And it's beautiful work. Um, the two robots coordinate, they build them, they have a map, they, they come up with a cooperative strategy, and so on. Uh, it only has a one downside, is that the only objective we were considering at that time was making sure that we find intruders, if any. Uh, consequently, the robot moves at a ridiculously slow pace, uh, such that if you are really trying to sell this thing to some customer, the first thing they would say is, okay, I'm okay with finding the intruder, but it should not take hours. It should be, you know, uh, time should also be part of the um, objective function. And similarly, you know, if the environment is inhabited by people, then most likely you won't like to make sure that these robots do not get too close to people. So, indeed, focusing only on just one objective function was not the right, is not the right thing to do. Of course, eight years ago, it was a very different situation, and, and this was completely fine. Uh, I'd like to, the question, to mention one thing. Andreas Colling graduated in 2009, um, so eight years ago. The last paper from his PhD dissertation was accepted last week, um, and on the transactions are robotic. So we have been persistent with one last piece we had to publish, and, and eventually got out eight years later which is a proof of complexity of, complexity of this specific algorithm. So the, a lot of the work we have been doing is, is um, relying on this tool of constrained Markov decision processes. Uh, and I guess a lot of you are familiar with the idea of Markov decision processes. Uh, and if not, this will shortly uh, introduce the framework. Uh, it starts with an assumption where usually people uh, will disagree or can accept, which is the assumption of state observability. Um, and if if that's the case, what happens is that if you have a robot that is in a certain state, um, let's call it x1, and this is always uh, known, then uh, there is an algorithm running on board which executes a policy, pi of x1, which more or less says, okay, given, us, given that I am in state x1, pi of x1 tells me which action I should execute. So typically, we are, all of this is in the discrete domain, so you have a discrete number of states, you have a discrete number of actions, uh, and so on. So when the action is executed, what happens is that you make a transition, and this transition is non-deterministic. So you don't really know what is the next state you're going to land into, but it's only probabilistically um, described by this transition probability. So this is a probability that if you are in state Y and execute action U, you end up in, a, uh, in state X. So um, the state is observable, but once you, make an, uh, you execute an action, you don't know where you're going to end up to. Uh, however, once you land in that state, you can observe it, and so you can, you can know a posteriori where you end up to. 
So when you execute an action, what happens is that in the classic Markov decision processes uh, framework, uh, you just pay a cost, which is a function of the state you're in and the action you execute. Uh, in the constrained Markov decision process uh, scenario, on the contrary, you pay multiple costs at one. And usually we split them in two groups. There is a primary cost that is indicated with letter C. And then there are many additional costs generically indicated with the letter DI. So, uh, I can have D1, D2, Dm, depending on how many costs I have. So every time I'm in a state and I execute an action, I'm going to pay all of these costs at once. Uh, I land in a new state x2, and then from that point, my policy tells me which ex action to execute. I execute it. I land in a new state, and this is only probabilistically known. I again pay these costs, and so on and so forth. And this goes on forever. Okay? So the difference between the Markov decision processes framework and the constrained Markov decision processes is that in this case, you pay multiple costs at once. Um, so when you have multiple costs at once and you want to somehow write a controller that optimizes with respect to, to these costs, uh, you can do two things. Uh, one, which is very uh, common in literature and we really dislike, uh, and this is based on, on, on the end user input, is that you, you can take all of these costs, uh, you combine them in a linear function, and then you have your back with to the case where you have just one objective function, and then you're back to what you know how to do. We, we know how to solve a problem with a single objective function well. Um, the reason why we don't like that, and the reason why our, our end user uh, would not, did not like that, is that very often these costs are completely heterogeneous. Okay? You have energy, you have time, you have safety. And then what does it mean to add these things together? It, it relies on some magic numbers or some magic com linear com uh, multipliers that m make no sense, and they're very arbitrary. And even if at a certain point you find this magic conversion factor that, that translates hours into joule or, or whatever your heterogeneous things are, after you have solved your problem, you are optimizing with respect to an objective function that have very little meaning in reality. It's something that people will have a hard time to understand because it's mixing all these things together. So you have a, the objective function uh, at the optimal point is 47. What does it mean? Uh, it's, it's just combining together things that, that don't make a lot of sense together. So an alternative way is to say, OK, I have all of these costs at once. And then what I do is that I split them in, in, in two groups, as we said. And one, the primary function, I'm going to optimize with respect to that. Um, and with regard to the others, I'm not going to optimize with respect to the others, but I'm going to put bounds on those. So imagine now we have a robot that every time it executes an action, it spends time, and it consumes some energy, and it travels a certain amount of time, or a certain amount of um, meters. So you can say, OK, give me a policy that minimizes the total energy spent subject to a bound on the fact that I'm going to complete my mission uh, within 20 minutes, and I'm not going to travel more than 700 meters. OK, now all these three costs are still separate. You can set up the problem in a way which is much easier to understand. And then when you get the solution at the end, it is formulated in terms of these three costs that are easy to, to um, interpret for a human. Um, so just one slide with the symbols that are going to come up later on. So uh, what happens is that you set up the problem the following way. X is a state space, which is finite. Uh, for every action, you can take a certain, sorry, for every state, you can take a certain set of actions, which is finite as well. Um, and then as I said, there are, there's a primary cost. So every time I take a certain action from a state, I pay a cost C. And then there are an additional number of uh, costs, uh, which are the DIs. So, the C cost is a primary and needs to be minimized. And the DIs are the additional costs, and those will be bounded. And all of this, this minimization and this bounding happens in expectation. Okay? So you can have the, occasionally, the occasional realization of your stochastic process where you have very bad uh, outcomes. Uh, but in, in the average, this is what we are um, optimizing or bounding in expectation. Then have P, which is a transition probability. This accounts for the unpredictability when I execute a certain action uh, given that I'm in a certain state. And there is a technical thing uh, which is necessary to specify, but it would be, would be tedious to explain. In Markov decision processes, when you write a policy, the policy is going to be good no matter where you start from. Okay, so this is you compute a policy which is kind of global. Uh, so it doesn't have a sense of initial state because it ba is basically memoryless. Okay, no matter where you started from, the same policy will apply. For the constraint model decision process, it actually does depend on from the initial state. So you have to somehow express where your system starts, starts from, and this could be a uniform distribution over all the states or something else. But th that is a technical thing you have to um, specify. And then there is a, a goal set. So the objective is what the objective is that 
your start state is somewhere that is described by this initial distribution. And then you want to figure out a sequence of actions that so that eventually you hit this goal set. And while hitting this goal set, in expectation, you're going to minimize these primary costs that you incur during your mission. And you want to have these additional costs to be bounded in expectation. So the objective then is, OK, for every state, what is the action I should execute in order to, max, to, to achieve this objective? Okay? So the policy basically is, is what is going to map states into probability distributions over the, the action set. So this is a very important thing uh, to, this, to say. In Markov decision process, we all know from many, many years ago uh, that the optimal policy is deterministic. For every state, there is only one action which is optimal. The moment you introduce the constraint Markov decision process framework, when the moment you have these constraints, there are certain states in which it is possible to show that actually the optimal policy is random over the set of actions. Okay? There are certain states where the optimal thing you can do is to execute one action with probability P1 and another action with probability P2. Okay? So this is, a, this is why the objective is to find a function not at mapping states into actions, because that would be a deterministic policy, but it's mapping states into probability distributions over the set of actions. So constraint Markov decision processes have been used quite a bit uh, in, in telecommunication, uh, mostly for packet switching policies, apparently. Uh, but in robotics, they have not been used a lot. Uh, people have used Markov decision processes a lot, but the constraint version, not, not very much. And in fact, if you look at the papers you find in literature, they are all pretty, pretty recent in, in the sense of applying this, technology, this, this methodology to robotic problems. Um, however, as I said earlier on, they have easier to interpret solutions because now your, your policy gives you quantities that you can relate to how the problem was expressed as opposed to a linear function that doesn't mean much. So as I said earlier on, I said every time you execute a, mm, an action, you, you pay a certain cost. And, and also I said that you want to mm, design a policy that will minimize this cost. So as we all know, we can compound these costs together in, in different ways. And so this is what something we've been doing um, recently um, in this line of research, which is to use these total cost criteria. So typically what you do when you have these kind of problems, you have either a policy which is executed for a fixed number of steps, and that is known up front, so that's finite horizon, or you have something that runs uh, infinite amount of time with, with a discount factor. Okay? Um, and we, we, somehow we're pushing forward this idea that that is never the case in robotics. So when you bring a robot to, to the floor to execute a task, very often you don't know up front how long it will take to complete the task. So specifying up front how bound or you know, within 20, action, 20 steps you have to be done is, is very unnatural in many situations. And the other idea is that having this discount factor for the future, that's a mathematical trick to make some sums to converge. Uh, but in many applications, you know, if I have my robot, um, and I bump it into a wall and it's a total loss, you have a hard time to convince me that if I bump into a wall three days from today, I'm, I'm going to be you know, paying less because it's discounted by a factor of three uh, Okay, for a gamma equals 0 0.95. So the idea here is that the total cost criterion is this one. So you just add up all the costs you incur over time, no discounting factor, and you, in, you add the cost from time zero up to infinity. However, if you just write it like this, this sum in general will, will not converge to a finite number. So what you, we will have to assume later on is that we have to assume that the underlying structure of the problem is absorbing, which means that no matter what policy you, found, you follow, eventually you end up in a state from which all the costs are zero so that you make sure that this thing um, uh, will converge to a finite number. So if that is something that you can ensure that is relatively simple, as I will show you later on, then the pre previous problem can be solved by writing a big linear program. Okay? But the big linear program where more or less you say, I want to find the optimal policy that minimizes the cost, the primary cost followed to find this way, subject to these um, bounds on the additional costs. The problem is that if you write the problem this way, it works. And by the number of decision variables you have, you have one decision variable for every couple of state and action. Okay? And so even for simple cases, you may end up having this linear program that has a ridiculously large number of variables. So having problems where you have 100,000 variables or more is, is very common. And of course, we can solve linear programs very, very uh, easily these days. Uh, but at the same time, if you would like to have replanning and so on, this becomes too, uh, 
this becomes a burden. So um, the work that then we have started to, to look into is, OK, rather than solving these problems in, in their original formulation, can't we some, come out, somehow come up with a hierarchical formulation where we cluster st states together so we come up with a, a linear program which is much smaller and then hopefully uh, faster to solve? So that's the idea behind it. Uh, the idea is that, OK, we start with a pro problem which could be this one on the left, which is now a hypothetical um, tough problem. And then we take the original state space, we cluster it uh, according to certain criteria that we will have to discuss in the following. And hopefully then every cluster of states that you see here in, on the left maps to a single state in the new problem. Uh, the red state you see here is the uh, goal state, and that would map into a goal state in the reduced problem on the right. And so the idea would be, OK, can we start from a constrained Markov decision process that has a state space which is large, somehow compress it into an, an equivalent or an uh, associated problem which is much smaller, solve this one, so hopefully way less states, way less variables, much faster to solve, and then map a policy found for this simple problem back into the original problem. And then hopefully we should be faster, and the solution that we get should not be too um, different from the optimal one. It's obvious that if I'm doing this step where I cluster, I solve this proxy problem, and I map my policy back, I, something has to give. So an optimal solution in this case cannot be equivalent to the optimal solution for the original problem, because I am somehow uh, solving an approximation. The hope is that this gap between the approximate solution and the uh, optimal original solution is, uh, is small. So similar ideas have been used uh, in the past for the case of Markov decision processes, but they were not um, used at all uh, for the case of the constrained Markov decision process. So what is the idea here? The idea is that I start from this um, problem, and then I build an identical problem where the sub, not an identical problem, a related problem where the sub h means hierarchical. And so you see that for all the ingredients in my original problem, uh, the state space, the action set, the probability, the primary cost function, the additional cost function, the bounds, and so on. I have an equivalent version for the hierarchical problem with the objective of saying that in the hierarchical problem, the number of states I have is going to be much, much smaller than the number of states I had in the original problem. And so I will solve the hierarchical problem. I get a hierarchical policy. And then from hierarchical policy, I want to map it back to a policy for the original problem where there are much more states. And so the two questions uh, that one has to solve is, how do we build the parameters for a hierarchical model? So how do I compress the problem into a smaller one? And the other question we have is, OK, once I have a solution for the hierarchical problem, how do I map it back into the original one? So how do I map the um, pi star h back into pi star? So the idea here is, in order to build the, the hierarchical model, is to put similar state, where similar is something I will have to define in a second, into uh, uh, to group together similar states into macro states. And similar here means similar in terms of the cost function. So if I start with my original uh, setup and I have a lot of states, and I find two states that are nearby, and so they have the same cost in terms of primary and, and uh, additional functions, I will combine them together into uh, a cluster uh, state. And uh, there's a formal requirement here, uh, which is uh, formalized uh, in, in the papers, and more or less says the following. If in the original problem, I can find a sequence of inputs such that I can go from state x to state y uh, with a non-zero probability, OK, so there is some sort of connectivity here. Then once I build my hierarchical version, my original state x will end up into a cluster xh. My original state y will end up into a cluster yh. And then what I have to ensure is that if it was possible to go from x to y in the original problem it ha through a certain sequence of actions, then it has to be possible to go from the macro state containing x to the macro state containing y in the compressed problem. And this is necessary to, to do in order to guarantee that uh, I preserve uh, solvability, which means I don't lose solutions in going in this, um, in making this uh, combination of states. So that's how the algorithm works. And without getting into the, the, the details about all the um, 
nitty gritty um, processing inside there. Uh, the idea is the following. Uh, if I have states that, are, that have a similar cost, then I combine them together. However, there are two issues here. Um, if I start to combine these states together, uh, and I just keep adding them to these clusters, I could be in the uh, absurd scenario where all the states end up in the same cluster, and so I'm back to basically the, the original problem. So I, I didn't compress anything. Uh, so we have a, this is one of the parameters we have to, to pick, which is the maximum cluster size. So a priori, we have to decide uh, on what is the maximum size that the cluster can have. And so if later on I find states that should be added to a cluster because they have similar cost, if the cluster has reached its maximum size, those cannot get in. A new cluster has to be started. Uh, the other opposite situation is that if you set the maximum cluster size equal to 1, which would be ridiculous, uh, so what you do is that you are also back to the square 1. It's the same problem because you impose that all the clusters have, stays, have size 1, which means that your compressed problem is going to be identical to the original problem because every every state in the original problem end up in one state in, in the compressed problem. Uh, so the, you have these two extremes. And so in essence, what you do is that you iteratively start. And what we do is that initially we put the goal set into a cluster on its own. And then we walk our way back from uh, the goal set backwards uh, through these operators, uh, which is basically the pre-image uh, of a set of states. And as soon as we find states that are similar, if they're they can be thrown in a, in a cluster which is not too big. We, we throw them into that cluster. If not, then a new cluster uh, is started. And then optionally, what, what we can do is that we can um, merge small clusters. So if we end up for some reason with clusters which are too small, uh, there is an optional sp uh, step which will try to um, uh, merge these clusters together. This is something that we have observed experimentally. Well, sometimes be uh, advantageous, uh, sometimes not. So this is not really uh, as impactful as, as this step here. So after we have combined these this states into clusters, the next thing we need to um, produce is the actions. So now my original actions don't make sense anymore. They are defined over a set of states that are gone. I have new states, which are these macro states. So I have now to define uh, states over this set of macro states. And this is relatively simple. So if now I have two uh, macro states, which somehow could be joined uh, by, if we think back about this picture here, actually, this is the best thing. There we go. So if these two macro states uh, include the two states, x and y, such that I can go from the original state x into the original state y, then this macro state can get into this macro state. And so in, in essence, once I have built uh, the clusters, if I look back at the actions that are applicable to the states which are inside these clusters, then I can define this set of actions, which more or less say I can go from this cluster to this other cluster. So that's very simple to do uh, numerically. And this brings us to the hierarchical planning. So the hierarchical planning more or less goes as follows. That's easier to explain with a, uh, with a drawing like this. So this is my original state space that has been now combined into three clusters. And now suppose that I want to go from this um, state here to that state there. My hierarchical policy will basically say, oh, I have to go hypothetically, from here to here and from here to here. However, the physical robot doesn't work in the hierarchical space. It works in the physical space, in the original state space. So what we do is that after we have solved and computed the policy for this compressed uh, CMDP, assuming that I need to go from this macro state to this macro state, what we do is that we compute the boundary between uh, the uh, two macro states. And these are uh, original states I have. And I'm going to solve now a constrained Markov decision process in this smaller state space where the objective is to hit this boundary. Now, this problem is much smaller and then can be solved um, efficiently. And it will allow me to navigate from here to here. Once I hit the new macro state here, I compute the boundary between these new two states. And then I will 
follow it, and so on and so forth. So in essence, what I do is that after I have computed the, um, the clustering, what I do is that I compute a policy within each of these much smaller um, CMDPs. Each of these policies tells me how to go from one CMDP to the other, and then I just follow this thing as a sort of similar to a gradient descent. So the couple of theorems that are um, that can be uh, shown that that hold um, um, for this algorithm, and the first one is basically that um, a typical result in, in this kind of sampling algorithm. It says that if you keep determining this uh, building these samples to compute these costs uh, with an increasingly uh, higher number of samples, then Basically, you preserve the connectivity, which is one of the two um, properties I said earlier. And the other thing is that, in essence, when you build a compressed state, you don't lose solvability. So if there was a, an optimal solution, uh, if it was possible to go from state A to state B in the original problem, it is possible to do that also in the compressed problem. So one of the reasons why I like robotics is that I like algorithms, but I like more when I run the algorithms on the, on the, real, on the real robot. So, uh, we have done a lot of validation for, for this um, kind of framework. So we started with some MATLAB simulations to have an idea about how, how this idea works or not. And then we ran a lot of experiments with the real robot as well. So in this case, uh, just to give you an idea about how this works, uh, we have two costs. One is uh, the primary cost is risk. So now we're going to see that the robot has to go from this point up here up to some point down here. And the uh, heat. Um, map here describes the risk. So in essence, the areas which have a warmer color are, are riskier, so you would like to stay as far as possible from those, if possible. And the secondary cost is length. So if all things being equal, you prefer taking, uh, you, you put a bound on, on the length of the uh, path. And so here are two uh, different uh, solutions. So the robot has to start from here, has to hit this point um, down here, while trying to minimize the um, risk, which is the accumulated value of the heat map through the, through the path, and subject to a constraint on the length of the path. And as we change that, uh, different paths will be um, produced. So this is an example of how the clustering goes. Uh, so the goal location goes in the cluster on its own, and then you see that all the other states have been grouped into uh, these irregularly shaped clusters. And the invariant there is that each of these clusters is smaller than this maximum uh, parameter ms we uh, specified when we built the, the, um, the problem. And technically, the way that was built is that all the states that are inside the same cluster tend to have the same, same risk. If you look, there is this area inside here that is uh, more risky than everything which is around it, and it ended up on a cluster on its own, which was exactly the idea that we had when, when we uh, designed the clustering algorithm. The clusters should be made of, cost, of states that have similar costs. Um, so here is a little table with comparing uh, these algorithms. The one thing that is um, to be observed here are these three different families of algorithms. Uh, and this is the time to compute the optimal solution. So the NH here on top is the no hierarchical. So this is the original problem. And this is the time it takes to compute a solution in expressed in seconds. So you see that it goes from something like 59 seconds, depending on how you place the start and goal location, all the way to 1,300 for other uh, more complicated cases. This is an algorithm that actually we started tinkering with in the beginning, and the idea here the, of this fixed um, the composition algorithm is that rather than trying to cluster states in this way where similar states end up in the same cluster, you can just take and build these clusters in a way which is agnostic to the underlying um, cost. So you can just say, you pick a fixed shape, and you just apply that um, without any consideration of the states underneath. The advantage that is that it is much simpler to build uh, the clusters that way. However, you can easily build cases where you can lose solvability. So the hierarchical problem will not have a solution, even though the original problem had one. So it is simple, but it doesn't have the same guarantees. Um, 
The values here at the bottom are the hierarchical problem under a uh, different set of parameters. I didn't have time to talk about all the different parameters you have to put in place in order to um, uh, run this algorithm. But basically, the first number here is the largest number, largest size of the cluster. Okay, so 100 means that every cluster will have at most 100 uh, states inside. Uh, 10 is the smallest number of um, elements in the cluster, and nm is the num merged version. As I told you, once you have built the clusters, if you want, you can combine them together or not. And so out of curiosity, in some cases, we did run the merging algorithm, or we did not run the merging algorithm. So you can see that for the same set of parameters, if you have mer merged version versus no merged versions, the, para the performance doesn't change dramatically. However, if you compare the numbers at the bottom, with those at the top, uh, in particular with the first line, you see that there is a dramatic reduction, reduction in time. And uh, the important thing is that it also shows that this technique is not too sensitive, actually, to the specific choice of the parameters, which is something I like, because the moment you have three or more parameters to fit, then it becomes a daunting task to tune and figure out what is the right, uh, the right combination. Uh, so this is just computational time, which is interesting, but uh, really it's not the only thing to think about. How, what happened to the um, objective functions? So here is the um, chart for the primary cost and the secondary cost. So this is the one we are minimizing. Um, and so the, diamond, the blue diamond is the non-hierarchical version, and the other symbols are the hierarchical uh, version. And as you can see, there is, there is a loss, um, and, um, but the loss is, is, is bounded. Some specific cases as, appear to be weird, and it seems like that our algorithm does even better than the optimal one. Uh, there is an explanation for that. The reason the explanation is that if our algorithm fails to find um, some intermediate steps, it may relax the constraints. And by relaxing the constraints, it's, it's able to find a solution which is better than the original one. So there, there is a reason why it seems absurd that our approximate algorithm does a better job than the optimal one. But the deal is that in making that approximation, we have relaxed some constraints. So it is able to take some shortcuts that the original one would not be able to. And similar thing for the secondary cost, we see that the, the performance of the uh, non-hierarchical um, algorithm is not that far from the um, performance of the hierarchical one. So this is the one part I'm not happy with, but it's also the one part that uh, we could not find a better answer. So we can theoretically prove that um, we're going to be complete. So if a solution exists, the hierarchical algorithm will find a solution. We have identified the, the conditions under which we, this will happen. However, when it comes to measure the gap, we don't have a closed formula that will relate somehow this gap to the number of samples or to the number of um, uh, or to the size of the clusters and whatnot. And I guess this is what happens when, uh, I, I'm not even sure that an answer exists, but in a sense, at that point, I felt that Shams had done enough work, and, and this was probably enough for him to stop and, and move on to the, to the next um, um, problem. Um, what is interesting is also that as you change the size of the partitions, um, as I said, there is this parameter ms, which is the maximum size of the partition. Um, you will have different performance. What is interesting is that it seems like that there is this nice spot that if you pick your maximum partition size equal to 1% of the size of your original problem, it seems to be the right thing to do. So if you think about the time, if you plot the time it's, that is spent to solve uh, the problem for different cases, it seems like that picking this value uh, for the parameter equal to 1% of the original, uh, of the size of the original problem seems to be the right thing to do. What is interesting is that if you go in either direction, if you make it too big or too small, uh, the time explodes. Because if you make the partition too large, basically you're not compressing anything because your compressed state is equal to the original space. And on the contrary, if you make your partitions too small, every state ends up in a partition by its own. And so you're, re you're again solving the same problem the same way. So then uh, we went into some uh, more fun part. So it was um, testing on a P380 robot, which is something that we all uh, love at universities, right? Because it's, it's a, our 
platform of choice for many of these tasks. Um, and so this is the management building at UC Merced, for those of you that have never seen it. The interesting thing is that it's a huge building, but uh, even if it is a huge building, it takes a lot of student time and persistence to travel 5.5 kilometers inside. And this is the amount of testing that was done to get some, some, some numbers that would convince ourselves about uh, the performance of this algorithm. So this is the floor map of the building um, built autonomously by the robot. So this runs, just runs the standard G-mapping algorithm you find in ROS. These are different locations where the robot would start um, and, and go to. And this is the um, associated risk map. Okay? So this is something we, we came up with. So there is a corridor down here, which we assume it is um, low risk. And then up in this region, uh, risk is defined as the distance from the closest um, obstacle. And so again, uh, the setup is like the previous one. We want to find a path between these couple of points subject to the uh, objective of minimizing the cumulative risk as you travel through and having a bound on the specific path length. Um, interestingly, I mean, even if you go from a simulated scenario to a realistic one where all the transition probabilities were extracted by, by um, fitting the data we got from the robot and whatnot, the results we get are more or less the same. Uh, so in essence, then, then we, we, we're kind of happy because uh, now we have found a way to solve these planning problems which are um, tough and, and, and require or consider multiple objectives at once in a way which, which is much faster. Uh, there is, however, a number of interesting problems that one could go after um, in the future. And this is exactly what we are working at right now. And this is the talk I wanted to give, but we haven't finished yet. We are writing the journal version, and it's, it's a few experiments away. So, and this is work done with Marco Pavone, who is running BARS um, uh, this year. And so, this MDPs and CMDPs problem always optimize with respect to expectation. Okay? And however, in many scenarios, that is, uh, it's unacceptable that you have this occasional realization which is very far from the expectation. Okay? And, and, but all of these frameworks do not consider that. As long as you minimize an expectation, you are, you are good. Uh, can we extend this kind of algorithm so that we not only minimize with respect to the expectation, but also we, we don't get into these surprising occasional realizations that are very far from it. It seems to be a problem about mean and variance, but it's not, because variance is basically symmetric, right? Uh, here, on the contrary, you typically are only interested in, in um, minimizing deviations from the expectation in one direction only. If your robot once in a while takes 10 hours to complete a task rather than the expected one hour, this is what you're really unhappy with. But if occasionally it takes two minutes rather than one hour, you're, you're totally OK. So vi variance would, being a symmetric ver uh, measure would not be the right thing to do. And the other thing is that robots often execute mo more than one task at a time. So not only they have multiple costs to consider, uh, but they may be doing more than one thing at the same time. So can we use the same? kind of machinery to uh, solve these tasks uh, when there are multiple of them at once. And so I just want to talk about this thing because it's the thing I'm, I'm more excited about. Uh, and then we'll get to the end. So when you have these policies that um, are executed in a robot, typically we put a, a cost if we are minimizing or, or, or a gain if we are maximizing. And that, that is a random variable, right? We always do some sort of, expect, uh, of optimization with regard to that. And due to the uncertainty in, our certainties in the environment, that, that ends up to be a random variable. So I think there is an interesting set of open questions about how can we now uh, go past the idea of optimizing only with respect to the, to the, the expectation of these random variables, but also in taking into account the fact that there are these occasional um, um, very rare uh, realizations that we want to stay clear for. So it turns out that the math for that kind of uh, problems exists. It, it mostly comes from computational uh, finance. It's called value at risk, average value at risk, and so on and so forth. And the interesting thing we're doing right now is trying to bring this into the realm of, of planners. Um, so as I said, uh, this was a ICRA paper last year. We're finishing up the, the, the 
journal version. That's maybe another bar stock for next next year after after it gets out. Uh, and I guess that's that's it. Uh, so um, the take home message. I mean, of course, I mean it's always impossible to to give technical details in, in one an hour talk, uh, but. I mean, I think the interesting thing is that as we rely more and more on robots, we would like these robots to, to do many things at once and, and to be optimal not with respect to just one specific measure, time, energy, uh, path length, and whatnot, but they have to be somehow good at all of these things at once. So this requires to, to think to a new class of, of planners which are cognizant of these multiple costs uh, at once. And the, the, um, the algorithms we have developed use the, the framework of multiple decision processes that have been extended. Uh, to, to consider multiple costs at once. If you do that, it's a vanilla formulation. You will have it with these problems that have huge state space, um, so more than huge state space. They have a very huge um, linear program to solve. And the algorithm we have developed somehow compress that and give you a fast solution uh, much more efficiently. I guess that the thing that people may not like is that some people are not OK with the assumption of the Markov decision process. Some people will say, no, the state is never observable, so you should use POM DPs and, and whatnot. And, and in that case, I think it's legitimate uh, criticism in many situations, and this, this will not be applicable. But there are many cases, particularly if I think about when you're out in the field doing robot in agriculture, very often if the state is the position of the robot, well, you have GPS and you know where you are. So it's not always the case that life is mean and you don't know uh, the state of the robot. There are certain cases in which it's an acceptable uh, assumption, and in certain cases, it's not. And the last slide, which is the one I always, I'm always, always uh, happy to show, is that, OK, nothing happens without all the PhD students around. And I'm particularly happy because the list is growing, and they're all getting nice nice jobs. So Nicola now is an associate professor back in Italy. Andreas is at iRobot. Gorkem has run his own startup in Turkey. Benjamin runs his own company. Shams is at um, Intuitive Surgical. And Shuo is at Amazon Robotics. So, and the other three are still trying to finish. So <laughs> they will hopefully soon um, get to the same um, level of jobs. That's it. And I thank you for your attention.